So now, man, this colors are really unfortunate. I apologize. Um, so now we've, we've gone through the same exercise as before. That is to say, deleting the, uh, that yellow Tetris piece worth of data. And that was sitting right here. Now, when we go to uh, write our new section, which is this chunk, we include a skip sector. So we had one, two, three, four, five, uh, pardon, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sectors that we were writing. We round that up to eight. And so this chunk here is now accounted for. It belongs to that stripe. Um, it increases, it kind of uh, bloats out the amount of space that we're using, but it means that we never are left with these stray sectors that we can never make use of. So this is a subtlety of RAID-Z that um, was kind of, uh, it, it, it turns out to be important to keep in mind for some other reasons. So the skip sectors, again, are important so we don't lose them. We don't, we don't have these stray sectors that can't, that can't be made use of. Um, but the variable width stripes uh, that we need to, to uh, avoid that rate five right hole also create a complication. And that's to say, we don't know in a given stripe how many parity sectors there are going to be. It's, it's, this is unknowable a priori. Um, if we write a bunch of small chunks, we'll have a bunch of parity, and if we bunch, write a bunch of large chunks, we have a larger amount of parity. So a very simple question would be, let's say I have a four plus one RAID-Z configuration with, made of one terabyte hard drives. So how much can I put there? And unfortunately, the answer is, well, it depends. It depends on how you do your writing and kind of temporally how you do your writing and, and what block sizes and things of that nature. So um, if you're building a storage system, and I, I know that many of you are building storage systems out of it, or and many of you are using storage systems out of it, knowing how much data you're, how much data you're actually going to be able to store on your RAID-Z system is uh, very difficult to compute. In fact, in the worst case, RAID-Z uh, if you're if you're writing the smallest sectors, you have the smallest ZFS block size possible, 512, and you've got a RAID-Z configuration, it will, in the worst case, only provide you as much space as mirroring does. So this is a, a very subtle point uh, that's important to kind of communicate to your customers, and also important when you're when you're designing the way you lay out uh, your your. Uh, your pool configurations, and the way that you design your applications, because uh, this can really affect how much you get out of your disk. Any questions on this? So there's another implication of the skip sectors, which is important um, with regard to performance. So now if we took that same graph, uh, that, that, uh, an analogous graphic from before, and we took one of those columns and laid it down outside, this is what it might look like for an individual disk. That is to say, data pertaining to one chunk, maybe some skip sectors, data pertaining to another chunk, another skip, and so on. But these are really, these, these skip sectors turn out to be really bad for, uh, for hard drives. What hard drives really like to do is get a huge chunk of data and just splat it down to disk as fast as possible. Um, just just the, the, the head is spinning, the arm isn't moving, and we're able to write data very, very quickly. Each of these skip sectors creates a problem for the, for the hard drive and a problem for the hard drive firmware in that um, it needs to do some work to skip it. It needs to, uh, it needs to do some work in the firmware, potentially, uh, and, and, and potentially miss that sector uh, for a revolution or two. So it creates a real performance problem, all these skip sectors lying around. And in particular, it impedes ZFS's ability to do I.O. aggregation. Normally, uh, when we're doing a, uh, ZFS takes our random writes and turns them into big streaming writes. Um, and part of the way it does that is it takes smaller writes and it sees that they're adjacent and then chunks them up into much larger writes. So ZFS tries to write big 128K chunks to a, uh, to a disk every time in order to get maximal streaming performance. But it can't do that, of course, when there are these chunks sitting in between. So for reads, it's actually quite a simple answer. And, and this is an observation that, that Jeff Bonwick had in about 2008, I think. Uh, he called this the, the mind the gap fix. So he changed the aggregation code, the IO aggregation code. So if it noticed that there was a small gap between reads that you wanted to perform, just read the whole thing. Just uh, create a read which is large enough to span them both. 
which is a pretty, pretty simple solution. Um, and that got a nice performance win. Now, writes are obviously a little trickier. We can't just decide, you know, it'd be really useful if I could just write a little bit more data, because of course, that data might contain information which is useful to us. Uh, so we can't just blithely write over stuff. Um, so, but we do know when we're skipping a sector. In the RAID Z code, we, we do the calculation about when we need to skip a sector and, uh, and, and kind of are cognizant of that. So what we do is we generate something we call optional IOs. So anytime we're skipping a sector, we insert a, an optional IO into the, ZF, into the ZIO pipeline. Um, then when a disk is, when we're writing out to a disk and aggregating IOs that go to that disk, we can see those optional IOs and decide whether or not they're going to help us create much larger chunks. Um, and if they do, what we'll do is just, you know, B0, write a bunch of zeros out um, in order to, to, again, aid that aggregation and allow us to get better performance. So this is um, an activity that, uh, engineering activity that I did in uh, 2009. And I'll show you the results. So on the left, let me just describe this graph a little bit. This was done with a Sun Storage 7410. We had 48 one terabyte 7200 RPM uh, SATA disks plugged into this. Uh, and we were running a multi-threaded streaming write load. Uh, these numbers here are megabytes per second. And so in order, we have mirroring RAID Z1, RAID Z2, and RAID Z3. So we see on the left here that, uh, that mirroring is, is dominating and go down. Now, after we made that, that adjustment to include the optional IOs, uh, let's see, RAID Z1 went from about 650 megabytes a second to almost, excuse me, almost a gigabyte a second. So a tremendous performance improvement um, by including those optional IOs. Some people find it surprising that we can have RAID that's outperforming mirroring. And the reason we can, because obviously mirroring is very simple and goes very fast and, and kind of we talk about mirroring as being the fastest option typically. Uh, the reason we're able to do this is because we can effectively bring more spindles to bear on the problem. Uh, if you think about it, if for example, in a, in a um, four plus one RAID, um, we're losing effectively a fifth of the bandwidth to just writing out parity. Um, in mirroring, we're losing half of the bandwidth to just writing out parity. So um, it makes sense that with, with these RAID configurations, we should be able to exceed what we're able to get with, um, with mirroring. Well, I guess that was kind of another good news part of the talk, but it was set up with bad news. Um, Quick question. Yeah, Frank. There was no SSD in that last chart that was pure uh, spinning rust. That's right. So this is this is a pure write throughput test. Um, I, I think a, a point that you raised, and we're, we're going to get into that in just a bit, but there are kind of four basic ways to measure a system. Write throughput, read throughput, write IOPS, and read IOPS. Um, ZFS rarely gets into kind of a, a state where we're bound. ZFS is good at read throughput and write throughput, I think, uh, and, and, and getting better, obviously, as this demonstrates. Uh, write IOPS aren't really a problem for ZFS because, again, ZFS takes a bunch of random writes and, and turns them into streaming writes. So there's, there's never a scenario where ZFS becomes write IOP bound. Read IOPS are more interesting, uh, and we'll get that in, in just a second. But yeah, there's no flash involved there, which is typically an IOPS accelerator. Um, so resilvering. Resilvering a traditional RAID 5 system is really, really simple. Um, you know, if you have N plus 1 disks, we just burn through the disks as fast as possible, uh, reading the data off of it, uh, XORing it, and then uh, comparing it to the parity we expect. So again, this is really a throughput problem. Um, now, off of, a, off of a decent hard drive, you can get 50 to 100 megabytes a second. So, you, so even one terabyte drives, you know, that's two to four hours. Um, you can get through that pretty quickly. RAID Z uh, walks the metadata to discover the layout. Again, we can't tell without looking at, uh, just by kind of examining the disk, where the parity is versus where the data is. So you need to walk the metadata in order to infer which is parity and which is metadata. Pardon me, uh, which is parity and which is data. The good side of this is that we don't have to bother with anything that hasn't been written to. If you have a uh, RAID Z pool that only has a couple of megabytes on it, it's going to resilver liquidity split. As opposed to if you take a hardware RAID system like uh, you might get from NetApp, pull a disk, put it back in, that RAID system can go crazy trying to resilver even though there's, there's no data sitting on, on it potentially. On the downside, 
we have to go read all of that metadata. If you have a lot, if you have a lot of data in the system, you have a lot of metadata, and that actually turns into now, Frank, a, a read IOPS workload. Another downside is that it's proportional not to the amount of data you have stored, um, or, or even the amount of data that's in that RAID Z stripe, but instead it's it's uh, proportional to the amount of metadata you have across the entire storage pool. So that, that means to say. If you have a storage pool which has, um, you know, 100 4 plus 1 RAID Z1 uh, VDEVs, that's going to re resilver, and, and, and it's full, that's going to re resilver much more slowly than a single 4 plus 1 uh, RAID Z1 uh, pool because you have to walk the metadata for the entire pool, not just the metadata for that particular device. So again, uh, some pros and cons here. Um, the, the marketing department at Sun um, had kind of a hilarious observation. They made a slide that said the resilver time was a huge advantage for the Sun Storage 7000 series because they got a Sun Storage 7000, they got a NetApp, they put no data on it, they went to resilver, and of course the 7000 series was like, I'm done, because it knew it had no data. The, you know, the, the, uh, the NetApp box took hours and hours. Now, they didn't ever run the tests where they loaded up with with tons of, uh, of data to find out that actually the NetApp box was going to be much better in that case. Um, and unfortunately, we also didn't, weren't able to st stomp out that fire before uh, they published it to a bunch of customers who were then very unhappy when RAID Z resilver didn't go quite as fast as they had promised. So, again, a subtlety of RAID Z, uh, you know, we get, we get the benefits of having software RAID, but the complexity uh, like this. And now we get to random IOPS. So, um, I talked about read three earlier, and you guys were probably spacing out or checking your email on your iPads or whatever. Um, but read three actually is relevant for for read Z for the following reason. Uh, read Z, I mean, pardon me, read three was less than read four. It was it was uh, read four was a step up from read three for the following reason. Read three would take a block and chunk it up and then spread it to all of its disks. So in order to read that block back, I had to go speak to each disk. Read four uh, was an improvement on it in that it took a bunch of different blocks and put them onto different disks with parity protecting them all. That means when I, when I wanted to go read a, a block off of, RAID uh, off of RAID 4 or RAID 5, I would just need to talk to a single disk. Um, as it says here. So RAID Z is actually much closer to RAID 3 than it is to RAID 5 or to RAID 4 in that uh, RAID Z takes a block, carves it up, and, and puts it onto a, a bunch of different disks. So what that means, and I think you guys are probably aware of this, but perhaps not uh, the reasoning behind it, for a stripe of width n, read Z, uh, a registry stripe has one nth the number of random read IOPS available to it than a RAID 5 system would. Okay, so again, uh, a, a bit of complexity here. But do random IOPS matter? And uh, you know, I, I see we have some representatives from, pardon me? Just, all right. Uh, so, uh, back in 2001, when, when Jeff and Matt started uh, ZFS, you know, the, the plan was to work on disks, 200 random IOPS. Uh, but of course, now we have SSDs, which are giving us, you know, this happens to be one from Intel that they quote 35,000 random read IOPS. Uh, but, but, you know, you can go to a, a large number of vendors now and get SSDs, which do a similar amount of work. So, do random read IOPS even matter in this deck? Um, because again, these, these flash SSDs have just more random read IOPS than we would know what to do with, potentially. Um, so why not just burn them for Z, RAID Z and, and problem solve, right? It's like, well, but the reason we were going to flash was because we wanted many more random read IOPS, so I, I'm, not, I, I'm a little bit reluctant to just flush those, those down the toilet uh, for this, for this uh, specialized type of RAID. Um, but then on the other hand, you know, if I, if I take a system and I load it up with 100 of those Intel SSDs, can I really use, uh, you know, 3.5 million read IOPS? Like, well, maybe, maybe not. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a complicated calculus. And then uh, the L2R comes involved. Uh, people familiar with what the L2R is? A couple of nods, a couple of bobbleheads. So uh, the, um, 
the L2 Arc, for those of you who weren't nodding, was, is a, a large uh, flash cache that, that I designed as part of the hybrid storage pool, and that exists on the, on the Sun Storage 7000 and others. But this is a, a, another way of mitigating um, the need for many random read IOPS. 